Um, I could ask many, many more questions, but I think we need to uh, open it up uh, to uh, you, the audience. Um, please, uh, when you ask a question, uh, identify yourselves and uh, use the microphone uh, in front of you. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Sam Tota. Uh, I have three reasons to be here. Uh, number one, I have five sisters who can't be here, so I'm here to listen to what you have to say. Number two, I want to make a connection with what's happening around the world on women issues, and I haven't seen this institute or other institutes or <coughs> institutions speak up on these matters, specifically what's happening in India on the rape cases and what happened in Pakistan about the miss, uh, the 17 year old. So the third reason I want to have comments on why you don't speak up on those issues and why I don't see anything in the newspapers and other people uh, less knowledgeable than yourself speak on those issues. The third reason is I, I had the pleasure to listen to Ms. Adams more than 10 years ago about the history of the toilets. In a province where people don't know their own history, I thought that was a, a real courageous talk to, to give us the history of the toilets. So I came again to listen to to what you had to say about uh, different issues. Thank you. Thank you. Any comments or? Maybe Carrie. Uh, thanks for your question. Uh, regarding the recent cases, we would love to have a panel or something talk about this at some point, which we think would be a great idea. I know many of us are talking about it in our classes. Uh, it's part of our conversations with our students and with our colleagues. Um, so we are beginning to talk about this, but if anybody would like to uh, talk to me later about the potential of having some kind of event around that, I would be very, very open to that. Yeah, and uh, Elizabeth? I, uh, I think you've actually gone to the heart of a crucial issue, uh, particularly gender violence. I also would say sometimes that one feels constrained by not wanting to make cross-cultural claims to speak out of turn. And, and yet I think what you get at the heart of is really that's not as crucial as um, speaking out on these critical issues. And it, it seems to me we do come back again and again to core issues uh, around um, that gender, rape, violence that, that, that persist and um, are hugely important. So thank you very much for that question. Um, hi, my name is Bishop Johnny, and I just had a question for Natalie about um, when, when we're speaking about the historian's voice and the interaction with your subject matter, the, the prologue of um, Women on the Margins, where you have this imaginary mm -hmm. conversation with the women that mm -hmm. you later write about, mm -hmm. just the thoughts behind that and how, whether that was more of an emotional journey for you or whether that was very much a consideration in your research, how these women would have taken your questions about them. No, it was. Uh, Oh, uh, it was it was certainly the second. I did think about how they would react, but it was uh, also <coughs> what <coughs> excuse me. It was an effort to do exactly what Elizabeth said to to locate me. I mean, they had left me this material. On this, this material was their gift to all of us, and I'm using it in my own way. And I wanted to to uh, uh, show that that space between their own way of looking at the world and, and my own. And of course I was writing it so in some sense I had control over it. But I, I, wanted, and I wanted my readers to, to think about that, that it was a way of, of uh, uh, decentering me, uh, in the, be in the margins with them. <laughs> uh, that, that, that was a risk when I wrote it. I had a lot of trouble with my editor who didn't want me to put that in. She couldn't write a regular preface. And uh, some people were very bothered by it. I love it. I, I think I really thought that was the best part of the book, <laughs> to, to create that, uh, uh, to allow people to see. Well, it wasn't necessarily the best part, but to, because the best part was their lives. But to allow people to see uh, 
or that that disparity and and to recognize that in some sense I was modeling the <coughs> Yes, I'm going to change the yeah. direction of the questioning, if that's okay. I have a question I'm, for Anne-Marie. Is that okay? Or do you want to carry on in the storytelling? I'm happy to. No, 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 that's fine. No, okay. I'm ready for you. Kate. You're ready for me. Here I come. Uh, Anne-Marie, I, I have a question for you about, um, you, you're training architects. You're training people who are going on to design buildings and work in the world. Um, and I wonder, could you just give us your reading of the extent to which you know, sex and buildings, thinking about gender, uh, is having, is it making, does it make a difference? Or, or are there social forces out there at large that are changing the practice of architecture in the world uh, in ways that you would, um, that you would detect? Um, to put an optimistic spin on it, the um, growing interest in sexuality and gender and space is not part of the core curriculum. However, I think that um, as we uh, attract more and more enlightened colleagues and many women professors um, to speak about these issues, it, it seeps into studio courses and um, courses on building regulations and fire codes and all of the things that don't seem very connected to these, is these issues. Um, but I also think that, uh, that most of the really interesting work is done at the PhD level and at the school we're lucky enough to have the only and largest PhD program in Canada with 40 mm -hmm. students. So we have this like really dynamic group of students working on uh, many gender issues and I think that makes a huge difference just in the school. I'll only add that uh, it's quite important to study architectural history in the context of a professional school. I made the point of doing that myself and I think it's, uh, it's a way to change the profession to have that um, coexistence of research and practice in the same building. Thank you for your question. Norman. Uh, Norman Ingram from Concordia, Professor of Black and French History and Chair of the Department. Um, I was, first of all, thank you very much for, for the three presentations. I, I thought they were very interesting. Uh, I was struck, however, by, by the, the fact that, that, that all three of you, in, in varying ways, uh, seem to have described a kind of intellectual itinerary that began in socioeconomic history over the built environment and ended up uh, in some way uh, dealing with, with issues of gender and sexuality. And I'm wondering whether the three of you would like to comment on the political question, because it seems to me that that's one of the conundrums that's sort of at the heart of what Joan Scott is on about in that uh, uh, famous uh, article from the American Historical Review, uh, if gender is, 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 is in fact a useful category of historical analysis, then she posits that it has to be about statecraft, it has to be about diplomacy, it has to be about military history, it has to be about high politics. And it seems to me that that, 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 that is the case, uh, and it has been um, discussed in that light by a very few <coughs> historians, and I'm thinking, for example, of Joe Bellicott and her work on <coughs> feminist pacifism in Britain uh, and the, the link that she makes between a profoundly gendered view of British uh, political history in the, in the First World War period and in the interwar period and, and, and issues of gender. I'm thinking also, if we take the sort of masculinist point of Harry uh, Oosterwies' article on, on medicine, male bonding, and homosexuality in Nazi Germany, which really posits a profoundly gendered way of looking at the German state and suggests that gay people in Nazi Germany were uh, excluded because of their opposition to an essentially masculine conception of the German state that was posited on the men of work rather than the family. So I'm wondering if, if, if the three of you could comment on this, this political issue, which, which I think is, is, is something which we, we sometimes neglect to to our detriment. Uh, I think uh, you're quite right that uh, 
the uh, gender issue uh, must be brought to bear on uh, political life, statecraft, uh, state building, state representation, diplomacy, and so forth. Just because uh, we haven't necessarily done it <laughs> doesn't mean we don't agree with you very strongly on that. Uh, some of the work that's been done, I did a little bit of contribution to this in terms of political symbolism, uh, on the establishment of the French monarchy. Uh, and it, uh, it was very, very, has been very much of, uh, influenced by uh, the laws in regard to succession in France uh, and political theory in regard to gender. Everything has made a difference, uh, and, and including finding analogies between structures of family and political thought. Uh, in France, and that has been done by scholars both in in France and people like Sarah Hanley and others uh, in the in the states. Uh, so I uh, uh, it, it just I just just think you're pointing to extremely important uh, areas uh, in work in post-colonial studies. Uh, I think that gender has uh, played a very important role in uh, some of the work done on the Raj. Uh, in India, uh, it's only beginning, I think, to to surface in regard to colonial regimes in the Caribbean. But uh, uh, man, I think that you've just identified an important area, and we are we have seen some progress there. Uh, it it uh, it's just it's just so happening. I think some of your work on uh, uh, policy of, of, of missionaries certainly had a, a political uh, aspect to it uh, in, in some of your own. Uh, and uh, I think you could maybe give some other examples. So uh, here, thank you for the suggestion, but I think people, uh, there is some start in that direction. <coughs> well, I would take on board you know, General Scott's fundamental claim that gender ideology is a way of talking about power, and therefore it's a very useful way to talk about states. I, I completely agree with you, and I think you could certainly uh, <coughs> In thinking about the construction of a colonial state, there are many powerful gender ideologies at work, as well as control of the actual bodies of women as part of the colonial process. So I see these things as deeply uh, interconnected. Thank you. Um, I saw a hand up behind you. Okay. Um, Alex Ketchum, a grad student at McGill. Um, I know that there's been mention in this talk of moving beyond the national as a category of analysis, but there's also been talk about the importance of geography. And between the three of you, you've worked at institutions in the US, Canada, and the UK, and obviously during different time periods. But could you talk about um, the differences you saw in these debates about women as a centered category and gender in these different geographical settings? Of the U.S., Canada, and the U.K. Um, yeah, that's actually really interesting. Although it's hard to distinguish geography from generation at this point because I've no. been here rather a long time. Uh, so my, I'm drawing on memories of the U.K. that are rather distant. Um, but I would say it was much harder slog in Britain, uh, but again, that may be something to do with generation. <laughs> um, my, I have a structuring memory of being at Oxford in these very, um, well, I hate to say it, terribly male spaces, these terribly male seminars where people, it was very, you only spoke with great trepidation and um, I, I feel that there was a structuring environment there that had a certain impact, but also sharpened uh, feminist d debates. So I'd say that debates in Britain seem to me, in some ways, to be angrier, to be sharper, um, partly because of this ever-present infrastructure. I, and I, I'm not sure everybody else would agree with me. I, I'm really just um, you know, brainstorming it, but that that's, was my own lived sense, was a very sharp debates, but against this huge background of inherited male privilege. It was kind of just absolutely everywhere. In, in a very visible, uh, visceral ways. And my sense in Canada was of, of less uh, intense, angry debates and a greater interest, I would say, in gender theory, just, just again, my own lived experience, uh, greater interest in queer history, history of sexuality, um, 
Yeah, but I'm going to stop there and pass it over to, to, to Nadia. It's a really interesting question. Suddenly it speaks to the ways in which contemporary politics shape what we think of as very abstract history. And my experience has been that contemporary politics always has an influence on what you're thinking about the past. Uh, the main comparison I would make, actually, uh, is between France uh, and North America. I didn't particularly know there was a huge difference between teaching in the States and, and Canada. That, but uh, uh, partly because in both places uh, there have been uh, courses established in the field, departments sometimes, uh, or at least programs. Uh, in France, uh, that uh, is still, it is still very much an issue, even though some ex extraordinarily important work has been published. A lot of pub in terms of publishing, not a problem. Uh, maybe easier in France in some sense, since they love to publish everything everybody reads all the time. Uh, but, but, but in terms of the, uh, the academic establishment, it is still something of an issue. And uh, uh, people say, well, well, what about at the Collège de France? Well, there are, in fact, one or two people who are doing this at the Collège de France. But the fact that people still say today, oh, but they're not there. Uh, or what about, a, you know, where are they at the Sorbonne? Uh, it's, it's still thought of as not central to uh, mainstream history, even though if you look at, the, as I repeat, if you look at the books, it is very much part of the, uh, of, of at least the, the world available for history readers. I think that there is less interchange between the people who are specializing in gender history uh, and those that are working on mainstream history. I gave the example before to the our colleague from York, uh, excuse me, from Concordia, uh, about um, uh, important books done on, um, um, on queenship and its implications for, for early modern uh, French political history. Well, the, the texts that were written there, and they're very good. They're good legal history, they're good symbolic <coughs> history, they're very sound, uh, uh, which make a difference. Are, are still not recognized by some of the mainstream political historians as relevant. And I think that I think that, that of course, that, that conversation, that exchange, that impact, uh, that, that, that happens now, I think, in North America, that there really is, is an exchange between the specialized field of, of writing about gender and the, the larger, it's making a difference. Uh, this has to do with Long, I mean, uh, I mean, Joan Scott would, ha would have a lot to say about this too. But among the issues that that affected that to begin with was a very powerful loyalty and an understandable loyalty to social history, uh, which was very much as associated with some version of class. Very powerful in France, and, and gender seemed uh, sort of like the old phrases of bringing in some kind of middle class diversion. Uh, and some of the very best, the Anal School to begin with, was very reluctant to, now it's changed, and they, this, is, this is a different picture, but it took, a lot of, it took a lot of doing. And then something about the structure of, of French academia, uh, very Paris-centered, so you could get certain groups there, whereas here in, in, in North America, maybe this is true of Britain too, this, this smaller world, you, the possibility of having different power locations, much more flexibility where you can set things up, made it easier to get things started. Uh, and then once they got started, the communication worked better, I think, across the different fields of the discipline. I'll just comment on um, my experiences in California. And Natalie, you are at Berkeley too, I believe, that uh, I think UC Berkeley in the 1980s was a, a wonderful university. I'm not sure it would be as um, satisfying today with all the the um, UC drastic budget cuts. But um, I can say that the wonderful thing about it was that you never had to explain why you, why you were doing a gender topic. It was just a normal thing. Um, nobody ever made you feel funny about it or embarrassed, uh, except maybe your parents or something. But uh, um, it was a uh, it was a very comfortable place to be doing early gender work and having place that people like Mary Ryan in the history department supporting me 
was huge. I remember when I asked her to be on my dissertation committee, she said it was her hundredth dissertation that she had agreed to, and that so like I was getting a special prize or something when you're like when you're the millionth customer. Anyway, so she was pretty popular. Um, I'm not sure that uh, that being in the McG uh, McGill in the 1980s would have felt like that, uh, for example. Um, so that, uh, that really helped me. And if we could just return to the question of risk, which I, I never really answered. I took my job at McGill before I had even started my dissertation. That was a very big risk. Um, and I guess thinking about the question of risk makes you think back about regrets. That was a really very bad thing for me to have done, except that I got this great job that I love. Uh, uh, it meant that I really spent the first three years here just crying every night, worried that I wasn't going to finish my dissertation because I had to be finished by my first uh, three-year review. I think that shaped my dissertation to some extent. Maybe made it better because I had to write it so fast. Uh, but it was a very, very stressful thing, and uh, I wouldn't recommend it to anybody ever. <laughs> Brian Callum from the History Department. Um, two comments struck me here, and they may not seem related, but I want to invite you to see whether there is a relationship. One was Anne Marie's comment that everybody got a shirk back in those days. <laughs> okay, that's evidently not true today. Right. There's something else that I heard that would evidently not be true, and that was Natalie's comment that, oh, we had to spend a whole day defending mm -hmm. adding gender and women into the curriculum at Princeton. Well, I can't imagine that happening at Princeton today. I don't that would be the case, <laughs> I hope not. Um, is there, I mean, on the one hand you might say, okay, well, here's one case in which we're facing uh, academic politics of austerity. This seems to be the, the rhetoric that's going around all the time. And yet, on the other hand, there's a greater space for adding gender into the curriculum. Is there, is there a connection here between these two phenomena? And, or, you know, to phrase the question differently, well, um, if, if these kinds of studies are being asked to go fund themselves, are they actually going to be able to survive in the future? Can I just add my, thanks Brian, my personal strategy, and I think I've been very lucky in this way, is that my other um, beloved topic is healthcare and healthcare spaces, which is very, very important to Canadians and to Canadian funding agencies. So what I've tried to do is combine my interest in healthcare and gender so that the healthcare stuff can support the gender research. I think we have to try to think really creatively in the way we package our work in, uh, in, the, in the landscape that lies ahead. Uh, just very quickly, I. I suspect that a sh problem with the funding crisis at the moment is going to be the difficulty of getting new topics on the table that funding committees are not expecting to hear or that governments can't you know, package in their list of things they want agencies to fund. Mm -hmm. I think gender is pretty safe, to be honest. I, mm. There are many things that I can't imagine, because I don't know about them yet, that might not get funded <coughs> because they might appear to simply too novel. I mean, that's the risk of a reduced funding environment. You just reproduce what you know. And similarly, the necessary push to team grants and big studies, which I think is also part of this, if the funding agencies are giving large grants rather than a whole bunch of small ones, is it does also make it harder to have extremely innovative work coming up from the bottom from people taking risks. So yeah. I think that's a great question, and I am rather worried about it. I have a comment that which, which is really more of a question. Uh, I've heard a great many colleagues uh, talk about the, uh, the fact that gender studies programs or institutes uh, currently, and this may not be true here, but currently uh, are, uh, are often dominated by very recent courses, that is things on, that, that is social, social studies, which is fine, I mean, sociology, uh, health, health issues, th things that are very much associated with 
the, our, our own day or, or the late 20th century. And that the, uh, those scholars who are working uh, in, say, the longer, the longer history of gender, whether it's in the West or elsewhere, the historians, the literary people, the people in art history uh, are continuing their work, and they may be friends of people in the institutes and the gender studies programs, but they're not closely integrated into the program. That most of the conferences that are funded through the center are very important. This is not a criticism of them, but they ha happen to be clustered around contemporary issues, and uh, that it that it is uh, more difficult for those working on earlier periods uh, in one or another of the humanities to get funded. Mm -hmm. So this is really a question, uh, and as uh, uh, this observation a meaningful one, and if so. Uh, would it be important uh, for the institutes and the gender studies groups, the ones working, uh, in, including, including architecture and the professional schools, to think about uh, linking up with uh, those working in, uh, who are doing gender work, important gender work, in these other departments, uh, going back to classics, I mean you've got classics in this, but going back to classics, medieval period, or uh, so that's really a question. Well, our teaching programs, for instance, I mean, we have uh, courses all over the university, Islamic studies, religious studies, history, and classics. And I, there's a classics professor who was just talking to me last night about wanting to do a new course on, I don't know if she's here, uh, <laughs> on um, gender and textuality of classic Greek texts uh, as well, um, social work. Uh, we've got courses all over the place, I would say, uh, and have quite a representation, in part because uh, to run an academic program in women's studies and in sexual diversity studies, we depend on courses being taught in other programs where there are faculty who have <coughs> gender studies approaches or feminist theoretical approaches to those topics. Uh, and so we require this interdisciplinarity uh, because we only teach a certain number of courses under our own course numbers, for instance. Um, in the institute, we've had lots of different uh, symposia. Uh, I mean, Brian, you were heading up one on the history of sexuality just a few years ago as well. Um, I don't know if you had trouble getting funding for that. I don't think so. No. Did you? No. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, and I haven't had trouble getting funding yet either for, we just had a big girlhood studies uh, symposium last fall, which had both historical work and had work from um, Australia and other parts of the world quite contemporary in terms of its sort of construction of what the issues are, but I'd say quite broadly interdisciplinary. Um, I think that's one of the things that defines what we do, at least. And thus far, like from granting agencies in particular, I haven't experienced trouble with funding with that. It'll be interesting to see if we do, but as Elizabeth was saying, there's so much impetus towards collaboration and interdisciplinarity that those are always good things when you're asking for money. Um, so the more one's able to do that, the often the better. Yeah. Good. Well, a question at the back. Hi, uh, Jeffrey Little from Concordia. Um, this is a question related maybe to something that Professor Adams mentioned about being the only female um, faculty member in her, in her area. But this question about, we've been had this great conversation about how um, women and gender studies has progressed through the academy over the past several decades. Uh, maybe my question comes to how have things changed for female historians of gender and sexuality and women's studies in the sense of being uh, female academics and everything that has happened um, or everything that, that um, we think about when we talk about being a female academic and the pressures and demands that are different from uh, those faced by, by men. <laughs> it's a very large <laughs> question. <laughs> I will say that I think academia is on some level really set up for 1950s guys with wives. <laughs> um, and <laughs> I don't think we fully got past that. I think that's not only an issue for women, actually, I think it's also an issue for men who might for example, want to be involved in raising their children in a way that this model doesn't fully allow for. Um, I think the biggest issue for me is 
actually that issue of it wouldn't be the same issue for other people, so this is a very personal answer, but for me it's the issue of children incorporating family into a model that assumes that you will spend your 30s um, you know, focused on the great works. Um, and I do think that there are still issues of gender discrimination that I see younger people facing, so I think it's still a real issue, but I think that some of the structural issues are also affecting men. Do you want to? You go ahead, Natalie. <coughs> um, well, as I say, I'm not teaching, I, but I talk a great deal to young, to graduate students, men and women both, uh, on issues that, that uh, with questions that are raised as they think about their future. Uh, there has been a change from uh, the 1960s when I was at the University of Toronto where we had to struggle for the idea that there could be a daycare center <laughs> at the university, uh, and where there were hardly any women. I mean, there were one or two of us in the department, uh, in a large department. And as I have, have said before, uh, when I would go to a meeting, uh, I would be, even though I had my PhD, I would be called Mrs. Davis and everybody else would be called Dr. So-and-so. And uh, I mean, that, that, was, that was an embarrassing moment. Uh, so things have, I mean, things really have changed uh, in that department in Toronto now, where there are a number of distinguished, very active uh, women, uh, and both men and women have have uh, have children. Uh, I was recently at UBC, and uh, one of the graduate students brought to a two-hour uh, seminar his daughter, and uh, that was fine. Uh, the most astonishing thing, I guess maybe this is a difference in child rearing or something, or maybe because her parents were Russian, but uh, the child in, was a good girl, a two-year-old, for, for a two-hour graduate seminar. <laughs> I thought, that, I thought, this is unheard of, <laughs> both in terms of child rearing styles and, and just that it was perfectly accepted that that, that, that could happen, so that I don't want to underestimate. Uh, uh, the, the thing that, that uh, quite apart from, from lack of, of, of acceptance, but quite apart from discrimination and so forth, I think that the challenge of, of putting together uh, a life as, as a parent uh, and a life as a scholar and a teacher uh, is present. I mean, that's, that's a practical issue even if there isn't discrimination. It's nice when you have daycare centers and some of the things that, I, that we had to struggle for, but uh, uh, this is something that we have to think about and think about uh, both social and political ways to make that easier for the young generation, as well as uh, work for uh, any attitudinal issues that are still are still present. But as I say, it really does look compared to the 1960s. It really does look. It truly has improved. I'll use that word progress. <laughs> uh, last couple of questions, uh, Peter, and then. Hi, I'm Peter Hines, the McGill PhD in the History Department. Um, question, so a lot of this work that we've seen says sort of gender as a category of analysis can explain so much. Um, how then do you account for that in, for example, you do projects in which, in my own primary research, I haven't seen a woman mentioned for about six months now. Um, so how do you account for that? I mean, there's certain other categories, say class or religion or things like that, which you cannot ignore. You'll, you'll get called out if you do ignore them. But in this case, it'd be a massive shift. If you want to talk about something like gender, it, it's sort of, there's a weighty imbalance, right? Um, all the sources talk about other things, and it's simply a matter of listing what they say. Um, this is a category that, you know, it's almost, it's pretty obvious by now that it should be used, but if you don't have the direct evidence, how do you account for any potential imbalance? Or how do you use this in those? Uh, okay, I'm going to have the unfair advantage of knowing what you're working on. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. Since you work on British uh, in India and the <coughs> military and alcohol, not <laughs> seeing a woman, male six months of, let, let me go out on Olympia, guys getting drunk in homosocial environments, I think, the, I mean, seriously, I think that you could actually do some interesting work. There, you're not thinking about actual women. 
but uh, about homosexuality, yes. about ideas of masculinity, what is it? You know, the military is this deeply masculine institution, so it's very helpful to think about it in gender terms rather than just taking it as given. My other hunch what is possibly that there might be sexual relationships with Indian women that are not being recorded in the records. And in that case, I think it's, the silence is really interesting. The fact that you happen to come across a woman in an environment which I'm willing to bet there was a lot of sexual interaction is it, also, I think, important and interesting. So there you can kind of start with, okay, what is it that male, how is male society being constructed here? How are men thinking about themselves? What's masculinity doing in the military? But then also, what are the silences? So that's a huge issue in, in gender history. What's not being talked about? And then you go with the silences. So I'm hopeful. <laughs> I would just add, add to that. Uh, uh, that uh, w as important as it is to look at this gender dimension and, and the enrichment that that might bring to your interpretation, uh, it's also true, and this is something I meant to was trying to suggest at the beginning, that gender is a useful category of analysis, but isn't necessarily the determining the most important issue in a circumstance. Uh, it, it, it's, the point is that you look to see in what sense it's present in shaping men's and women's relationships, with each other and self-definition and so forth, it, it may not be the most critical thing. That's that's important yeah, too. Yeah. Uh, there may be uh, other other issues, uh, multiple issues of identity, origin, religion, you know, all, all these uh, social status, economic interest that might be the most important. And and that's that's. Uh, but it's just that you want to run it, run that through as a, the gender. What is the gender possibility? How does it play here? And it may not play in a primary way. I agree that it's not, you can't take for granted that gender is the only central, only no. most important category of analysis. Let's have one last brief question, please. Uh, hi, my name is Becky, uh, I'm a graduate student in political science, so I have a question about politics. Um, and specifically, about women's history as a political act, and how that might relate to the women's history as a political act. So I'm thinking of someone like Elaine Wexner uh, in the 1950s writing her big tome of American women's history. Um, and then she wrote this as specifically like a, a feminist political act, right? That it wasn't just historical value, but it had contemporary political value. Um, so I'm wondering with the move to gender and masculinity, <coughs> if that feminist political moment or capacity for history is lost. Um, and if it's not lost, how does it play out differently? And if it is lost, do we need it? Um, and I guess secondarily then, do you see your own work as political? Um, and do, do you see it as political and do you see that feminist work? I think it's Rhode Island. Sorry, sorry, we should turn the mic on. Sorry. I didn't, uh, neither, we didn't quite catch the figure that you were. Oh, Elaine Flexner? Or sorry, mm -hmm. Eleanor Flexner. Oh, uh, I, I'm not, uh, I remember that book, uh, but uh, let me just address uh, the, the question of how, and I'm sure that uh, Anne and uh, Elizabeth will want us to speak about this too. Uh, I try to see my work, uh, in, I mean, in, apart from the pleasure of discovery and and so forth. I try to see my work as an historian uh, as having a critical edge. Uh, yesterday, I, uh, uh, Kate Deborah talked about my wanting to be a historian of hope, and in some sense, that's part of the that's part of the story. But by hope, I don't mean necessarily sentimental or promise of progress or what have you. Uh, but that uh, that at the very least, uh, history. Uh, shows, other, at the very least, other ways of living, other, the possibility of things uh, being different, uh, and shows uh, the complex possibilities in ways that we treat each other, uh, in the ways we think, the range of possibilities, uh, a whole range of in affect and construction and, and conflict, and uh, out, of, out of that comes the possibility of people thinking critically about, uh, appreciatively sometimes, but also critically about the past, 
and about the world in which they live. To go back to the first gentleman's comment uh, about uh, the, the deeply important <coughs> and moving struggle for, for girls' education uh, uh, in, in Pakistan and, and Afghanistan and elsewhere, when we write about the history of the struggle for that education uh, and the many centuries of arguments about it, uh, it, it raises a kind of critical perspective that is relevant to thinking about it today uh, and thinking about the continuum of that struggle. So uh, the historian in her role or his role as a historian should not be make, should not be manipulating the history to make a clear-cut political judgment that you do as a, as a citizen. Your, your goal is to spell out the, the range of behavior and to try to make it understandable as best you can Sometimes it's opaque and you can't. Uh, but I think having the possibility of having it a, a critical edge uh, is there. And as far as, uh, and, I, and this is true for a, a, a given feminist political position, but uh, insofar as, as you uh, are attentive to gender issues, the whole range of them, including sexuality and masculine femininity, insofar as you're, you, you do that, uh, your your uh, history makes people's antennae go up, and think about this <coughs> in other in other in other areas. So that would be my own sense uh, of uh, wanting. I mean, just as I opened that book with a dialogue, I would like the book to open a dialogue, not set set down a political agenda, but open a set of possibilities uh, for readers to think about and argue about that, and. Uh, Run with on their own, on their own, uh, with their own ways of looking at things. I like actually your comment, Nadia, about opening the, the issue of possibilities. It seems to me that in some of the actually truly horrible work that I've you know, done on rape and sexual violence and colonialism, I feel that's um, opening up the issue of a range of possible behaviors which it's politically extraordinarily important to keep in the forefront of our minds even if at <coughs> any, you know, any given moment we might not ourselves be grappling with those issues so I see that as <coughs> political and I see discussions of colonialism as, as political and having contemporary implications I also hesitate because I think there are many places in the world where women need, are, are engaged in struggles where write their, the, the ability to write their own history is still very important to them and where they don't necessarily have that space. It doesn't mean that I can write that history for them as a privileged outsider, but it seems to me that the politics of history kind of happen, haven't gone away and then that they, that they persist. Even at the same time, as I also see the politics of history as you know, deeply complicated and going in multiple directions, it's not clear that political history goes in one direction. There's one political claim that you can make from history. But for me, uh, history writing is always has, has that level of political in, engagement, I hope. And I guess um, just to add what might be obvious that I think if we, uh, in something like a professional school of architecture, if we teach people to understand the built environment from many, many different perspectives, not just the perspective of the designer, we will um, I hope end up with better buildings because the future uh, architects will have those multiple perspectives. Just to connect to Elizabeth's work, um, I, I worked on uh, Mount Cashel Orphanage just before it was uh, demolished. I'm very interested in demolition and trauma, interviewing the victims of that violence because I found in um, looking at hospitals too that many people blame buildings for traumatic incidents. I'm very interested in that and how that is um, later reflected or symbolized in the memorials that replace demolished buildings. So during the Mount Cashel um, court, uh, during the hearings, victims actually marked on a floor plan where incidents occurred as a way of uh, remembering. So I think although the building's gone, if we understand how those child victims saw the staircase and the shower and all the other places of horror, we'll make sure that we don't um, ever, ever build that situation socially and architecturally again. 
Thank you very much. Um, please uh, please uh, join us for a reception outside and uh, have some wine and cheese. Uh, I'd just like to thank our three panelists uh, for tremendously uh, inspiring uh, reflections uh, and words over the last couple of hours. Thank you.